Hi, I'm Norm Abram. Welcome to the New Yankee Workshop. A few years ago, I built a wine cellar for a client, and he loves it. It was a way to store and display his wine, and it had a lot of good design ideas. Now today, we're going to take some of those ideas and incorporate them into a wine rack that you can take with you, even if you have to move. I'll show you how to build it next, right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Boy, does this bring back memories. Way back in 1982, this was the subject house for another program that I occasionally appear on. You may have heard of it, this old house. It was an old rundown farmhouse built in 1840, and it needed everything. It took us about nine months to fix it up, and when we left, it was perfect, just like it is today, with the same homeowners, except Nathan here hadn't even been born yet. Let's go inside. Hey, Nathan. There are a lot of special memories here. We built a library with custom bookcases, a media room with widescreen TV, and Jack Cronin, our fine cabinet maker, built and installed these kitchen cabinets. And upstairs, there's an exercise room with a sauna and a steam shower. We even built a wine cellar. They're still talking about that. Come on. I remember building this winding staircase that leads to the basement. It just barely fit in here. And note the rail, it's just a wall of beadboard. Now this is the door that leads to the wine cellar. Boy, looks just like the day I left. Now there's plenty of room to store and display a hundred cases of wine and plenty of floor storage area. Now let me show you how the system works. It came from our friend and designer, John Gifford. You open up a case of wine, and you put one bottle in the display rack, and the remaining 11 go in these modular areas up above. Now, it's a very simple system built out of redwood, which has held up really well for 13 years, and it just has horizontal pieces notched into these vertical boards and little slats hot glued in place. Now, if there's any defect with this system, there's no table a place to open and share a bottle of wine. I hate to see them just using old crates. So maybe what we should do is design a piece of furniture, something that's portable, and we'll make the underneath a storage area for wine, and then a nice table on the top. And that's what we'll do today, back at the workshop. All right, I know what you're thinking, and you're right, I got a little carried away. It's more than just a wine table, it's a wine rack system. Now down below, I built in plenty of storage, enough for over 10 cases. And above that, an open storage area for wine glasses and corkscrews. On the end, I built some larger shelves to store the magnums. And above that, a small shelf, and then one big display shelf at the top. Now let me show you how the system works. You would open up a case of wine, put one bottle on display, and right below it, put half the case, and then do the same thing on the other side. Now, if you'd like to have this wine rack system for your home, a measured drawing is available with a materials list, and you'll hear more about that before the program ends. Now, I built ours out of redwood, and it's really a lot of small slats and pieces of wood. I want to start building the storage system first. There's a one by two on each side and a one by four down the middle. It gets notched out to receive these cleats that support the bottles. Now, before we work with any power tools, let's take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this, there is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. Now, this project is all about repetition. There are dozens of parts to cut the same length. And this is where a saw stop system for the miter box comes in real handy. It has a built-in tape and a stop which can be easily moved and set at whatever measurement I want. This first measurement is 29, and this means I can cut piece after piece exactly the same. All 
the 29 inch standards get dadoed on both sides. Now over here at the radial arm saw, I've installed my stack dado head cutter to start making those dados. The first cut is the one closest to the bottom of each standard. And take note that I'm ganging the standards together. I'm cutting four at a time. I align the end of each standard with this first indicator mark for that dado. Now to keep everything aligned, I'm going to slip in a scrap of wood and slide it down to the next indicator mark, which is right there. And I'll repeat that step five times. Now with one side complete, I'm going to flip the pieces over and repeat the process. Now these wider standards go in the center of the rack, and there are eight of them. They're dadoed in the same way. Now I'm ready to start working on the end standards and the center standards. They're a little bit taller because they support this display rack and the upper shelf. But the dados down in the storage section are exactly the same as the ones I just made, except there's one additional dado for a cleat that supports this shelf. Now these are the four end standards, and they only get dadoed on one side. Now with a higher fence and the tool elevated higher above the table and new indicator marks, I've clamped the standards together on edge. And what I want to do is make a notch for the horizontal pieces that will hold the whole system together. Now here's a group of three one by fours that are the center standards. And I've just made a notch on each side at the top area to receive a cleat that supports the display rack. The three standards that support the front of this display rack have to be cut at an angle, and that's 12 and a half degrees. Now let's take another look at the prototype. The next thing I want to manufacture are the cleats that actually support the bottles. Each cleat is 3 quarters of an inch thick, 7 eighths of an inch wide, and 24 inches long. Because there are so many cleats to make, it's worth setting up a system to cut them in multiples. So I've attached a scrap piece of 1 by 4 to my fence, and that allows me to cut four cleats at a time. I've turned my saw to 45 degrees to cut the bevel on the end. Now you'll notice that I did not cut it to a point. There's actually about an eighth of an inch of flat material left. All right, an even 100. All the remaining cleats that support the bottles are not beveled. They're just cut square. And I think it's a little bit easier to show you what's happening with some loose pieces. Here's one of the standards with a notch at the bottom to receive a rail which will tie the standards together. There's a little bit of a problem. If I tip it back, you can see that there's a void in there, and that makes for a loose joint. So for each of the cleats, I rabbited the end so that there's a little bit of material left, which will slip into that void, making a much tighter joint. Well, now let me show you how one of these goes together. The bottoms have the notches. And then I cut some scrap pieces of wood, which are for the distance between the outer standard and the center one, so that I don't have to make measurements all the time. And then we'll put a little dab of glue at each dado. All right, now we'll set the bottom cleat in. And now I'm going to secure these pieces with a one and a quarter inch brad at each location. Now the beveled cleats.
Now I'll just flip it over and repeat the process on the other side. Well, for the last few minutes, I've been building the two end and center frames. The end frames, of course, only have standards on one side. And the center frame, which is the last one to build, has standards on both sides. The techniques for assembly are exactly the same as what I used earlier. For the last few minutes, I've been working on the five cross pieces that connect the standards. You'll note that the back has been dadoed for every standard location. Now I'm going to make one design change. For the top cross piece, I let the dado show through on the prototype. I think I'm going to rabbit the top edge so that the shelf will conceal those notches. Well, now for a little assembly. We'll start with the center cross piece, a little glue and some one and a half inch brads. Now here's the one with the rabbit that will support the shelf. Now let's stand it up and put the cleats on the other side. Now we're ready to start working on the base. And underneath all this redwood is a heart of plywood around which I can bend the final pieces. Now I start out by taking two pieces of three-quarter inch plywood and attaching them together with screws. Then I've done the layout. By cutting both of them at the same time, they'll be identical. Now let me show you how this goes together. I take the two pieces that I just cut the curves in and put a spacer in between. It's all assembled with glue and nails. Now I've clamped the plywood form to the standards and I'm attaching it with some screws through pre-drilled holes. Now the reason for this is so that the base will be removable. Now here I have a piece of one by six that I'm going to use for the base. And the only way I'm going to be able to bend it around the plywood form is to make a series of kerf cuts almost all the way through the piece. And hopefully when it's done, when we bend it very slowly, it'll conform to the plywood and not break. Now with my radial arm saw tipped to 45 degrees, I'm going to make a miter cut on each end of the base. Now the first thing to do is to secure the base just where the kerf meets the kerf. Now next, I like to lay in a bead of construction adhesive. This will get in the kerf cuts and help bond the wood to the form. Now you never know what's going to happen. I've bent some pieces and had no problems at all. Others, I just barely get started and they break. I've even tried putting water on the pieces to see if that helps. Well, I don't know, I heard that crack. Not encouraging. All right. Oh, boy. Ah. Oh, not going to make it. Look at that. We were almost there. Guess it's back to the radial arm. Okay, there's another piece with all the curve cuts made. And this time I'm going to try everything. I'm going to put a little bit of water on the face side. Maybe that'll make the wood a little more supple and it'll bend around that corner. All right, well, here we go on the second attempt. I find that if you sort of work it as you come around with it, sometimes that helps. Uh, I think we've got success on this corner. Now a couple nails to secure it in place.
Ah, we did it. Well, so far so good. Ah, I think we got it. All right, now we're ready to set the other piece, but I can't nail it in place because I'm gonna actually have to do this twice. I'm gonna have to bend it once to mark it and then bend it again to install it. So prayers would be appreciated. That's gonna go pretty well. All right, now I gotta get a mark. All right, now I'm down to the last corner, and I'd sure hate to lose it now. Okay, let's get a mark. Make a couple cuts. All right, it's not over yet. One more time, we have to bend this around. Okay. All right, we're on a roll. This is not gonna break. Well, we're gonna clean this up, and that's it for tonight. Well, I got started this morning working on the band of redwood trim that sits on top of the base. There are straight pieces on each side and a curved piece that fills in the corner. The only tricky part is the curved piece. The side pieces have been cut at 22 and a half degrees. A five inch wide piece has also been cut on each end at 22 and a half degrees to fit tightly. Now to lay out the curve, I'm just gonna use a pair of dividers, which is set to the overhang of the straight portion and trace a line on the bottom of the wide piece. Now to strengthen the joints, I'm going to use a new glue. It's actually a moisture cured glue. And with dry wood like this redwood, it's recommended to even wet the surfaces because the moisture will actually help it cure. Now what I like about this glue is that it actually expands or it foams. That way it gets pushed into the pores of the wood. And I think it might work pretty well on these end joints. Now to ease the corners on the trim, I'm using my laminate trimmer router, which is set up with a quarter inch radius roundover bit. And I like to use this compact router to fit into tight places. Now here on the ends of the wine rack, I'm using some 5 8 inch thick slats to close in the end. And there's a 5 8 inch space between each one. So I'm just using a scrap as a spacer. Now for the end shelves. They're pieces of one by six with rounded corners. And what I'm gonna do is just put a little bit of glue where it meets the slats at the back and a couple screws into the base because I wanna be able to remove the base later. And the shelves are gonna stay per permanently fit. The remaining shelves are supported by the slats that go around the curve. And on the back of each slat, there is a dado it actually supports the shelf. Now at the front edge of each shelf, there's a one and a half inch wide piece that fits between the curve sections. Now here I'm forming the boards for the fixed, fixed shelf and they just have to be notched around all the standards. 
and just nailed in place. Now there's no attempt to make this shelf look uniform. Just individual boards nailed to the cleats. No glue, no biscuits. Now there are four support cleats that hold a display rack. The ones that meet the center standard are slightly beveled at 12 and a half degrees. And the ones that meet the short standards are just cut square. Well, for the last few minutes, I've been laying out this triangular piece of redwood, which is the end cap for the display rack. I have to cut it at a very long angle. So it's easy to do that with a small trim saw. Now I'll leave the line so that I can plane the cut smooth at the joiner. The last two cuts on this piece are on the ends, and that angle is 12 and a half degrees. A few screws are all that are necessary to hold the end cap in place. Now the top shelf on each end is formed the same way that I did the lower shelves, except I've rounded over the edges with a quarter inch radius. Because I want the shelf to be removable, I've pre-drilled holes for some screws that I'll put in from underneath. Now for the slats for the display rack. I'm going to put one on each end and one in the middle, hanging over the front rail by an inch and a half. Now for the bottom of the display rack. And this will keep the bottles from sliding off. I'll attach it to the slats with some brads. And here are the remaining slats. Now I want to make the cleats that hold the upper shelf. And they have an angle cut on the bottom. I suppose I could use the trim saw, but it's short enough that I can actually use my miter box if I make a jig. The jig holds the piece square to the fence, and this little stop holds the piece from sliding through after it's cut. A couple screws hold each cleat in place. Now a couple one by sixes for the top shelf. No glue, no biscuits. Now the final item are these pieces of one by two, which I've mitered at the corners, and they'll wrap the shelf. Now I suppose I could have attached pieces right on the edge of the boards, but I've rabbited them to make a nice snug fit. Well, I'd say we're just about ready for a wine tasting. Right over here. Well, I must admit, it was a bit of a challenge getting the rack down the cellar stairs. And as you can see, I'm a bit limited on headroom. But finally, a place to properly store the wine. No longer is it sitting in cardboard boxes that are moldy and falling apart. And I know where everything is. Now, I've had quite a few requests from friends for this rack system. In fact, I heard the local wine store is interested. So I guess this is an idea that a lot of people are interested in.